a lot of the projects right now are simply copycats of other projects. Yeah, I've seen that. You know? And yeah. one of the most important things about anything that sells, it has a story behind it. Anything that sells, think about the Bible. It has a story behind it. Yeah. You know, think about uh, Apple. It has a story behind it. All the big brands have a story behind it. The reason we love the NBA is because it has a million stories that we witnessed. What is up, guys? Welcome to the House of Clay podcast, the number one podcast on culture. We talk about art, films, music, fashion, and everything else. Web3, NFTs, art. All the in-betweens. Yeah. I'm your host, Digital Jeff, and Rolando Sanchez. All right, guys, we're going to get started. What are a few things you look for in an NFT project? I'm pretty sure it's a very broad question, but let's break it down to top three things you look for. I think the number one thing that people got to think about is not only about investing in the project, but also like people want to make money too, you know? Yeah. That's the, like people, people always like say like, oh, like I only care about the project. Like, nah, motherfucker, you care about making money too. Don't yeah. lie. We all want to make a profit or not lose, at least not lose our money. But the number one thing is the founding team. The founding team has, has to have a few requirements. One, they got to be doxxed. Meaning you got to know who they are. They got to have a, you know, some type of online profile. Yeah, maybe real people. Real people, man. You know, that's the first thing. If you can validate that, it's like, okay, what have they built in the past? Um, They don't have to have built something out of this world. But, like, do they have, uh, you know, are they responsible enough to carry a project for more than a year, two years, three years, five years, ten years? Are they able to do that? Yeah. Yeah. And then three, a lot of people don't think about this, but this is very, very important. Like what they are building, whatever it is that they're building, right? Can that idea or that business survive without the founder being present? Meaning that if the founder will, let's say, pass away, something happens to the founder. Does that project survive or does it die with the founder? And a lot of a lot of projects that are hot right now that pass the other two things about the founder, the third one doesn't pass. So I look at that. Long term, I look at that. Now, I'm not going to say I'm not going to invest in the project because of that third one. Yeah. But that's something I'm conscious about. Okay. You know. And, Makes sense. You know, you talk about like, for example, Apple. Steve Jobs died. Company kept going. He built something so strong, such, such a powerful idea that they're able to move on beyond the founder. Um, and some of the greatest companies, if not, if not the greatest companies, have that. You know? So that's the main thing. The second thing I look at is community and making sure their community is actually legitimate. So there's a lot of projects that have, like, the, you go to their Twitter account, they'll have 100,000 followers. You'll go to their um, Discord channel, they'll have 200,000 uh, members you go into the discord they have like a hundred thousand members and then nobody's talking mm. so red flag red flag you know like you and it actually like it's actually i rather buy into a project where a lot of people don't know about it okay. nobody like let's say let's say let's say i go into a discord and there's nobody talking about it but their twitter also doesn't have a lot of followers but i like the project i'll buy into it because I, if I like the project, that doesn't mean that the, the people will not come later. The people will come eventually. Yeah. Think about Board Ape. Like when they launched, or, or better example, CryptoPunks. Nobody knew about CryptoPunks when they launched. I mean, at least there was no hype around it. Yeah. At some point, they started at ground zero with the you community. Know, exactly. So you know, three, four years later, now they're hot. Okay. So you got to think about those things, and a lot of people like. A lot of founders, they get scared of like having very little amount of followers on social media because they're, they want to make sure they're, they're mint. When they mint, they go to public, they, they go through their either pre-sale or whatever. They want to make sure they mint out, they sell out. And it's a huge, um, a lot of pressure for the founders to be able to sell out. 
But at the same token, there's a lot of founders uh, that are just um, what they call rug pull, where they launch the project and they don't have any intention of actually fulfilling the roadmap. Long term. Long term. It's just like like cash grab, later I'm gone. Yeah. That's why they do those things. That's why they they pump the numbers to, to give this idea of like the fear of missing out. People are jumping into these projects like blindly without knowing whether the project's good or not. And honestly, like the all the times that I've lost money is have have that's exactly the way it happened to me. One of my homies told me, Hey Jeff, get into this project, yada yada. I heard about this, heard about that. And me instead of doing the research Listen to Homeboy. I listen to Homeboy. And then I'm down, you know, another ETH or two ETH, whatever, whatever I spend on that project. So, you know, you got to be very disciplined. And if you want to be long term, like I think, you know, the greatest investor of all time, the greatest trader of all time is Warren Buffett. And he talks about always, no matter how much you make in the trade, as long as you're, you know, positive in the trade, as long as you're in the green you're going to have a long career. And the thing with the NFT space, man, like you can have like nine bad ones and then one good one hits and you're like good again. So yeah. it, it makes you even lazier because of that. I've done a lot of the, you know, I'm, I'm giving you guys advice, but I've, I've actually done like a lot of the listen to the homie, put money in, skyrockets, make some, makes, I'll make some money from that project. And I repeat the process yeah i guess listening to homies can go both ways it can go both ways but the times that i've paid attention to like the project and listened to it and seen it for what it is um i've done well how often do you like keep up with the project like do you check it every hour every day is it random how, how? uh i mean it, it varies project by project so okay. it, it's gonna vary based on where you're at like if you're starting if you're starting to nft projects right now and you really like a project, I would say check it every day, man. Like check it, check on it every day. The thing, the thing with this, like all you need is one good project a year to be, to like for 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 your life to change. Yeah. Financially, you know. Um, I've done the opposite of like getting into too many too many projects. Oh shit. You know, like about uh, three weeks ago, there was one week where I was like in bought into like twenty different projects, <laughs> and it's. It's kind of scary, man, because you don't see the price as U.S. dollars. You see it in ETH, and you're like, oh, 0.1 here, 0.2 here, 0.3 here, 0.5 here. And then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, shit, I spent like ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 on buying NFTs. And the vault ETH changes quickly, too. So. And the price of, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's hard to track. When you're doing it like the way I was doing it, um, it's really hard to be successful at it because you really need to have either a team behind you checking these projects, checking the prices, other changing, like lot, like there was one project that I was so sure about. And um, the day of the launch, they, uh, they oh, for some reason, OpenSea couldn't connect to their contract. Hmm. So their images weren't loading, right? How'd you come across that project? Um, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter Spaces, okay. yeah. So, by the way, if you want to learn about new projects, the best way to learn about new projects is through Twitter. Twitter Spaces, man, there's so many projects right now. Like, there's thousands of projects launching every day, like, literally. But Twitter so, Spaces is a hub. Like, that's probably the, the hottest or Yeah, and there's about, uh, there's, there's probably about 20, 30 people in the space that are, you know, good influencers okay. that I like to listen to what they're, what they're, uh, what they're finding. Um, I personally feel like I'm one of them now. It's one cool. of those that finding, you know, fi- I'm finding good projects. You know, like when when it comes, like I, one of the reasons I I did what I did, like, and, and I'm not doing that anymore. Now I'm being more pers- like conservative when in terms of like investing into projects. Mm-hmm. Um, what I, the reason I was doing it is because I really wanted to know, like, I wanted to dive in deep into the space. Like, I wanted to know it myself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So. I was going into many different projects because of that. Like, I want to be, I want to know the game. Yeah, yeah. You got to let yourself, like, fuck up every now and then. Yeah. Just kind of like, that's yeah. how you're going to get better. Yeah, and I was, you know, I, and, I'm, and I'm over here, like, understanding every decision I'm making. And I'm saying, okay, I did this, this happened. I did this, this happened. I did this, this happened. So, my advice to you right now is find one good project. It'll change your life.
one good project. Both this goes both like we're talking about NFTs right now, but like the golden uh, grail of crypto is finding that one project. Every year there's like one to three projects. Crypto, we're talking about crypto here right now. Yeah. Well, I mean NFT also. One to three projects that do like a hundred X, two hundred X, three hundred X, five hundred X. So you know, you go in with a thousand dollars, a five hundred X, now you're now you're half a million there. Yeah. You know, with one project. But finding that project is what requires the work. Is what requires you being on Twitter spaces, being on, you know, different Discord channels. You Figuring know. out who the founders yeah. are, seeing if people are talking in the Discord yeah. channel. Okay, look okay. Up, look up their look up what I just told you. Who the who the who's the founder? That's the ma- that's the main thing. Like people don't look who the founder is. They look at the logo. They look. At, does it? Excuse me. Does it sound like interesting? Like, does it look is it, is cool? It yeah. yeah. People look at that before they look at the founder, and that's you know obviously we do marketing, so we understand how marketing works. And, yeah. Uh, you know, it's some of the. The most successful projects of this year will be right under your nose. And the, 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 the worst part about it is that the most successful projects this year are not going to, they'll probably not see like those 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 X till next year. Yeah. You know what I mean? They'll, they'll be like under the radar for such a long time and then they'll, somebody will discover it and it'll take off. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, well, I'll give you a perfect example of like a project that was overhyped, Pixelmon. Did you hear okay. about Pixelmon? No. Nah. So Pixelmon was a project. Uh, they promised a video game. It's a. It was a combination of like uh, Pokemon and Minecraft. Okay. And the founders, they did an amazing job marketing the project. By the way, the founder ended up being a 19-year-old. Yeah, no <laughs> experience in video game, like producing video games, nothing. But the way they marketed the project, the way he, he was, I mean, the, the kid's a genius, bro. Yeah. Like, tell, like, say what you want about the project, but the kid's a genius. Like, he was able to market the project. And I spoke to a lot of people that were really, that are really sm- smart in the space. Okay. Or at least I thought they were smart. <laughs> that told me this, this was the project. I did not have the money to buy into it. Like, I, there, there were, I think the, it was a Dutch auction when they released. Okay. So each, NFT was going for about three ETH. I remember. Yeah. So imagine oh. buying one token for 6,000, 7,000. How long ago was this? This is about a month ago. Oh, so ETH was already yeah, it was where about, it's at today, Muscle Yeah. House. So okay. it's about th- it was about 3K per ETH. So see, see, see. you're paying about almost close to 10,000 per token, bro. See. And <laughs> I was like, nah, not going to do that. <laughs> you know what I can do with that money? So, yeah. I, you know, because of the price point, I, I was not able to get in. And um, everybody lost their money, man. Everybody that everybody that bought, like I, I saw people. There was one guy that I know specifically. Um, he spent about thirty ETH in this project. Thirty <laughs> ETH. Uh, so you got to be careful. Um, look at the founders. Look at their roadmap. Look at the community. The community could be like if it's if you if you if you're the one that dis- it's because a lot of people don't know this. Like you could be the one discovering this project. Yeah. A lot of people don't understand that. You could be the one that discovers this project. So really learn who the founder is and what their message is. That's the first step. You know, what have they done? What have they built? Um, how old are they? Who have they worked with for before? Go fucking like stalk their Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Look at what they're doing. Uh, look who they're associated with. Another, another good one is collaborations. Okay. Look at what the project is. Uh, who they're collaborating with not only not only other individuals in the space but also uh, what other brands they're bringing in Um, that's a huge one bro like some of the best projects have the best collaborations collaborations yeah Mm -hmm. I mean you see people you see projects collaborating with like Adidas Nike Mm -hmm. and now it's like diving deeper into like the high end fashion so I can see collaborations definitely playing a big part one of my favorite ones, probably my favorite project um, in the NFT space is Smiles. Okay. By Wahid and Giovanni. Shout out, shout out. Shout out to Wahid <laughs> and Giovanni. Um, their project was so powerful because it, it came from an artist's idea, this, uh, this concept of tapping into culture, music, um, through a character. And... 
one of uh, what Heat's first collaboration was with Supreme. I remember this. But he was also collaborating with a lot of uh, hip hop artists. Yeah, yeah. He was doing this. The, like, this is the guy who had that image that went viral, um, where Young Thug was young it Young Thug? thug? Mm-hmm. Young Thug in the studio where he's kind of like it was originally the the image was a meme where he's kind of like confused, um, and he turned it into like a graphic image. I, 3D. I remember, yeah, three D. Yeah, three D. I remember that image just took off. Took off. Um, Drake reshared it. Drake reshared it. The whole world reshared and it. I think Complex magazine. Young Thug had it as his profile picture too for for a while. Exactly. So, you look at that, and you know at the time I think what he had like a couple of thousand followers on Instagram, maybe two thousand followers on Instagram. And Twitter, he had like also like a couple of thousand. Okay. And if if somebody would have come in and seen his project and his ideas and really studied who he is and what he's doing, who, who he's collaborating with, they would have been like, okay, this project's going to be great. This yeah. is going to be a great, this is going to be a winner. But if you would have gone in to see the numbers, you would have, at the, at the time, he didn't have the community he has now. If you would have gone and seen like, oh, what he has, what has he built before? Like those didn't, they didn't match with sense, him, yeah. you know? So, but the collaborations did. The collaborations were there. You know, so that, that's, that, those are the things that, you know, you, sometimes you got to take that risk, with, especially if you love the art. I, I, I don't think I've spoken about that, but like the art matters too. A lot of the projects right now are simply copycats of other projects. Yeah, I've seen that. You know, and one of the most important things about anything that sells it has a story behind it anything that sells think about the bible it has a story behind it yeah you know think about uh apple it has a story behind it all the big brands have a story behind it the reason we love the nba is because it has a million stories that we witnessed you know or you talk about the the world cup soccer why do we love soccer so much because it has stories that we witnessed that were televised, we were part of that, and we hold we hold it dear into our heart, and we'll buy anything that they come up come up with. So, I always tell people like, when you're looking into a project, look at the story, look at the story. If the story makes sense, is legit, it's a legitimate story too. It could be made up, but if the story makes sense, not only on the side of the actual founder or like the come up, w- what they're doing. But the actual story behind the project, like, why did they create this project? And what is this project uh, going to do? You know, so, for example, like, my favorite project right now, other than my project, <laughs> or my projects, because I'm working on three projects, but the main, the, well, I don't want to get into the, those, I don't want to show my projects right now, but other than the projects that I'm working on, my favorite project right now is based on this, this, this thing I'm telling you. They have the greatest story and the project's called MV3, by the way, MV3. Um, and MV3 has a story behind each character that they're making uh, an NFT for. Okay. Right? So every they have uh, all these characters. They all have a story. Uh, it takes place sometime in the future with these robots. Uh, they haven't really disclosed the story. But the, the, the story, there's also a second story behind that. It's the story of the founders. So Roberto Nixon is the founder of the company. Other uh, with uh, he has a co-founder. Roberto Nixon has built uh, a lot of different apps, you know, throughout his career. Has over a hundred million downloads uh, in the App Store just by his apps. He's he's a he's a design guy. He's a photographer. He's an artist, and he's also like a gamer. He loves playing video games. Um, he's a immigrant from. Uh, or first bo- first generation. I'm not sure. I'm not sure he's first generation. But anyways, he um, he created this project because he really fell in love with Web three. What Web three represented, you okay. know, this idea that we can own things now. We don't. We're no longer just, you know, uh, putting content up there. We own the content that we're putting up there. Nice. You know. So, uh, and then his sister is part of this project his sister is the writer of the story of these characters and his sister is a 
uh, was the executive uh, story. Uh, what do you call that? Like she's she was a writer for Stranger Things season oh, one. Oh shit! Okay, seventeen episodes or sixteen episodes. Damn. Yeah, and she was also a writer or ex- she was executive producer for Narcos. Pretty much every everything that she's written has been produced. You know, and it's, it's not only been produced. That's been that's uber one, successful. That's one step. Yeah. But like you talk about Stranger Things, it's part of culture, man. Yeah. There's not one person that you're going to be able to find that does not know about Stranger Things. I dare you to go find somebody. <laughs> she wrote the story, bro. Damn. People don't know this. That's the thing. Like when you find these projects, they got to have these stories. And if they don't have that story, the project might not do like it. It, it might need a lot of marketing money. It might need a lot of good luck. See, si, you si, know? Si, si. So me, for me, the main thing about everything that I do or invest in, um, I always look back at that. Story. Story. Does it have story? That's the question. Does it have story? And if it does, then, okay, let's move on to next, the next question. You know? Yeah. Does it have community? You know, do I love the art? Do I, you know? So, you know, that's, those are things to look at. Um, you know, and I think I think at the, at the, at the end of the day, uh, one of the main things that people are asking right now about NFT projects is what is it like? Why do I want to buy a token? Yeah. Other than money. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's a question to be answered. Like so people that, for example, somebody that holds a board ape or a V friends okay. or a crypto punk, they've been able to say that they bought this at a very, very low price made a lot of money mm-hmm. or at least value see, they see, haven't see, sold see. it yet a lot of them have a lot of people have changed their lives be, by selling one of their board apes yeah or two or three i know a guy that has 60 of them holy shit yeah well i don't personally know him i know who he is there's a difference yeah, yeah. <laughs> at one point it goes beyond the financial part of it i'm assuming right at one point it does but it really hasn't happened okay it really like it really hasn't paid off in that sense. So people call this utility. Like, mm-hmm. okay, what utility? What utility is this token gonna give me? Is this, uh, you know, what is it? Is, what is this? Ho- if I hold this NFT forever, what is it gonna provide for me? And that's the exciting part about the future of NFTs, because it hasn't been. There's there's no blueprint for it yet. Okay. It's being created by the innovators, you know. So that's what's exciting for me, be able to work on projects that c- provide that utility that nobody's thinking about. And that's, those, are, those are the projects that I'm really excited about because, uh, well, you know what? I also, <laughs> this is, I'm, I'm very, I'm on the contradict myself here. I also am a sucker for good art too. If I find a good artist that just has great art, like there's a guy I follow on Instagram, I'm trying to buy a piece f- uh, I'm trying to buy one, at least one of his, because I love his art. See, but he only releases one a week. By the time I get to it, it's already sold. Damn. So, uh, like, you know me, bro. I don't check my, I check my messages once a day. Yeah, yeah. You so, definitely do take a few hours to respond. <laughs> yeah, I'm, at, I'm gonna get better at that. But I don't. The only way for me to be able to get one of it, like, I get really lucky where I happen to go to. His, Instagram account at the moment that he's about to release one and I am able to get it. I'm just a sucker for his art. There's no utility behind it. I'm not getting anything besides the art. That's it. Yeah. But I love that too. You know, from the artist standpoint. Definitely. I was about to collector. say, like, because you're an artist too. So you yeah. can you respect that. And there's a huge connect. market for that. Yeah. I think people, like, I hate this, I hate this concept of, like, you tell somebody about your project and they're like, well, what's the utility? They get all, like, Nah, bro, it's beyond that. (laughs) And I'm like, well, you know what? Like, there is none. There's no utility. Now what? What does it make you feel is the question. (laughs) (laughs) But there's a lot of uh, collectors, man. You know, collecting has always been part of uh, the nature of uh, people that love the sport. And like, you think about, you know, the Beckett. Did you you remember the Beckett? I don't think so, no. So the Beckett was like a book magazine that was released weekly back in the days. Okay. And it would have every single card that was released that year or during that time period. Card? Card. Okay, was it like a sports card? Sports cards, yeah. Okay, okay. So collectors, I guess, uh, tops, you know, uh, upper deck. 
Okay. And you would be able to check the price of your card. Oh shit. You would check it manually, like you would look at the card that you like. You, you would go buy. You would go to H E B or Walmart or one of these. Well, not Walmart back then. Was there Walmart back then? Kmart maybe. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> you would go buy a pack of cards. You would open it up and you would look through all your cards, see which ones you got, and then you would go to the Beckett and then see. And if you were broke, like we were, we would stay in the store while we opened it and go to the Beckett, see the Beckett, <laughs> and then actually see. Oh, this card's like worth twelve cents, or this card is worth worth eighteen cents, or this card is worth like six bucks. Kind of like a phone book. Kind of right. like a phone book, yeah. Okay. But like it was, it was, it was like uh, maybe like forty, fifty pages. Okay. And um, you know that's collecting, bro. Like you were just collecting cards because of that. Like you, you had this idea. One, I never sold a card. I traded cards, but I never sold a card. Yeah. I was never like I was never like a seller, but I was a collector of cards. Hmm. I was collecting for the simply. Uh, for the love time. of yeah. con- uh, collecting, yeah, yeah, you know. So I still remember the first time I got a Michael Jordan card. Oh shit! Yeah, and I put it in my back pocket, bro. I was a dumbass. <laughs> no, I got it open and like, oh fuck yeah, I got a Jordan card. I was the first one for my brothers that got a Jordan card, and I was the youngest. And um, I was so excited that day. I had that card in my pocket. Every I wasn't gonna put it anywhere. I had it in my pocket. By by the end of the day, it was all messed up, bro. But uh, I had a Jordan card. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't. I didn't understand the idea of taking care of it. You know, see, I, see, didn't, see, I didn't see. comprehend that. I was. That's how. That's how. I think I was six years old when that happened. But, you know, it's um, it's this idea that, in this NFT space, like, utility is something that hasn't been really discovered. So the majority of people buying right now, they're either traders or collectors. Okay. They don't really like, oh, I'm going to buy this NFT because it's going to give me X, Y, Z. Like, it's going to give me access to, like, uh, a restaurant or it's going to give me access to all the NFL games. You Events, know, like, whatnot, those yeah. are things to be yet figured out what, how they're gonna, actually going to work mm-hmm. because um, it's such a new space, bro. And that's the beauty of it. Yeah. You know? Definitely a lot of room so, to, for growth. On all aspects. Mm-hmm. I'll have a question for you. Talk to me. In the NFT space, who's somebody you learned from online that you really learned from? Like, what was the first time you heard, like, NFTs become a thing? Like, was it somebody that said something? It didn't or? happen on Instagram. It happened on Twitter. What happened? On Twitter. Um, at one point last year, I mean, for, for, for a good minute, like, Twitter photographers were big. That Twitter photography community was big. Um, and a couple of guys that I follow started posting about NFTs. Like they started talking about NFT photography. Um, I think that's when I first started learning about or first was aware of what NFTs were, honestly. Um, I can't think of names, honestly, man, because I'm pretty bad with names. But the, the, the photographer space on Twitter mm-hmm. is what kind of introduced me to what NFTs are. Um, and then I started jumping onto their Twitter spaces and eventually I kind of departed from that space and kind of am now in listening to just a general NFT community. Um, but definitely Twitter, Twitter, pla- as far as platforms go, Twitter is probably the, the one that introduced me to the space. And mm-hmm. then Instagram is where I'm really just diving deeper into it just because there's a, there's a lot of nuggets in there in different places, different accounts that post kind of the way that I just told you, they have that first thumbnail slide with a big text that talk about whatever it is that they may be talking about that something that's trending or something new and then followed by a description or a video of talking about that thing so yeah not that sure if that nice. answer that's what you're looking for i know you wanted a specific name but i can't think of specific well names you right know now. what's interesting to me like i always think about moments in history that change at least me personally okay. my perspective on something hmm and I uh, was thinking about that question the other day, like, okay, who really changed my mind on this Web3 NFT space? Okay. There's two people I could think of. Oh, shit. Actually, there was three. Uh, the first one is Gary Vee. The way he was, his conviction behind it. I've always been a Gary Vee fan, you know. Yeah. Ever since Crush It, I have, I have all his books. Um huge fan so pretty much everything he says there's a lot of reasoning behind it i i feel like 99 percent of the stuff he says 
you know you rent a in some way yeah it's okay. true like yeah. take it to the bank yeah yeah he even though it makes it a little too intense but hey the truth hurts sometimes it's yeah. real shit yeah um and then two so gary v started talking about nfts like nobody's business um so I was like, okay, what is this? What okay, let me let me really get into it. By the way, I already I already had an open like I already had my MetaMask. I already had an open C account by the time this happened. So I was already aware of it. I was already like into it, but I really wasn't like taking it serious. So um the second person was Roberto Nixon. Cause I knew Roberto personally. You know, we uh, there's actually a vlog of us. We went together to Calabasas this uh to do this well we did the whole vlog where we go take photos and landscapes and stuff like that but you know from an artist standpoint like he was somebody i've always admired uh but he started talking about this web3 space hmm. and on his own personal instagram account this is before he had the metaverse account so i was like okay roberto's always ahead of time he's always ahead he's always like a year to he can see the he can literally see the, f the future bro and there's a video that i have of roberto it's me and him in new york city and we're driving uh and i say hey roberto like what are your what are your pr what are your predictions for uh snapchat in the next couple of years and this is back in 2017 so he's like oh i think it was 2016 2017 he's like oh snapchat 20 by 2020 20, by 2020 it no longer exists What's up, guys? So I got a little prediction here from Roberto. Got predi I think by 2020, Snapchat is not even going to exist. It's going to exist, but it's going to be such a declined user base that it's going to be an afterthought for most people. That's my prediction. He Obviously, he missed that prediction, right? Yeah. But he was always that guy making predictions. So when he started talking about NFTs and this Web3 space, I started really paying attention. And then obviously, the third person was, was Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg started hinting at this idea of Web3. Uh, I started reading into what, what he was talking about, yeah. this futuristic talk, and I was like, oh, okay, this is going to happen. There's no, there's no, like, there's no other possibility besides it's going to happen. Yeah, just because of how, like, I mean, the impact this guy has. Mm -hmm. I think um, this is not when I started realizing what, NFTs were were aware of it, but when he when they introduced the the rebranding of Facebook with Meta, that one video, I think we were sitting we were sitting in the office, that trailer where it's like they're in the jungle, and that's when it hit me. I was like, oh shit, like this is really happening already. Just because of I mean the impact that Facebook has on everywhere. Well, they changed the name, man. Yeah. That's so Meta. That's what, that, that that was definitely like a like a slap in the face. Yeah. Like, okay, dude, like. This is now. Oh, yeah. anyway, so the reason I ask you that question, mm -hmm. and I'm going to go to the next question, yeah. is because I want to be that person for a lot of people. I want to be the, I want to be that person where even though they don't say it or even remember it, mm -hmm. subconsciously, I was a person that turned them on onto this Web3 space. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of like, that's my inner hunger. Like when I make a video or when I'm tired that I don't want to make a video, I'm like, okay, let me make a video because this is important to talk about. And I'm thinking about that end goal. I'm like, okay, I want to be that. I want to be that guy, you know. You're gonna be the guy, bro. Yeah, I want to be that guy. That's yes. the move. That's, so the, that's move. the move. Yes. <laughs>